Can by H.R. Wakefield. I'd like to go with you, said Welland, but I think I'd better nurse this heel if I'm to get through the rest of the trip. Yes, certainly, agreed Seabright. You'd be a fool to attempt it. But I like the look of those silvery slopes above the wood. Well, ever since I was a kid, I've loved high hills and virgin snow. I don't imagine it will take me more than four hours or so up and down. All the same, it might be as well to get one of the locals to go with me. It's easy to miss the shortest way, even on such a simple climb as old Bruden looks to be. Well, ring for our worthy host and see if he can arrange it. Seabright pulled the bell knob, and a moment later the landlord appeared. A tubby, rubicund, midlander, genial, of andante intelligence, and consequently, a perfect peace with the world. Oh, Mr. Reddle, said Seabright, I'm going to climb Bruden tomorrow. Mr. Welland has a bad heel, and I want a companion. Would someone from the village go with me? <sighs> I don't believe they would, sir, replied the landlord. What on earth do you mean? Don't they like the look of me? Mr. Reddle shifted about on his feet. Well, isn't that, sir? But the chaps about here won't climb brooding when snow's lying. Why the devil not? Well, sir, it's just that way. They won't go beyond the wood on any account, and most of them don't like setting foot on the hill when snow's lying. But why? I can't imagine a simpler or easier climb. Is it because it's too much like work? No, it ain't that. I'm not a native of these parts, so I don't hear everything as a local chap would, but they've got some reason why they won't go above dim wood in the snow. Is that big spinny halfway up dim wood? asked Welland. Yes, sir. You know, the fact is they think there's something that wanders on the slopes above it when snow's there. Ha! <laughs> And hides behind the cairn and pounces on the unsuspecting climber, suggested Seabright, laughing. Yes, replied Mr. Reddle, looking startled. Well, that's just what they does think. Well, I'm damned, said Seabright. Do they think they've seen it? They're pretty close about it, sir. The chaps get sullen-like and changes the subject if it's mentioned. But it seems as though they think they've seen some marks. I gather it's a very old story, a sort of village secret. A very typical piece of folk funk, said Welland. A few probably perfectly explainable marks in the snow, and of course the devil or some other undesirable is abroad. Away goes the snow, away go the marks, and away goes the devil. Well, landlord, said Seabright, you're above that sort of thing. Come with me tomorrow, and help to lay what must be rather an inconvenient bogey. I don't believe I will, sir, said Mr. Reddle. What? cried Seabright. You don't mean to say you believe this tripe? I don't say I does. But I believes in being on the safe side in such things. I'd do the same if I was you, sir. Be damned to that. I'll climb Bruden if it snows ink. As you please, sir, but in any case you wouldn't want a guide. The way is as easy to find as hard to miss. I'll show you, if you'll look through the telescope. He takes the third turn to the right in the village, Dim Lane. That takes you up to that big clump of oaks. Then you follows the edge till you comes to a gate, and then you go straight up to the wood. There is a path through that, and then it's all plain sailing to the cairn. And now I must go and see about your dinners, sir. Pat Seabright and Leonard Welland differed in temperament as much as they differed in their command of this world's goods. Yet to have laid down his life for the other would have been considered a privilege by either of them. If the summons had come, neither of them would have hesitated for a moment. They had been the fastest, firmest friends for twenty years, Pat made an easy ten thousand pounds a year in his father's stockbroker's firm. Leonard secured from the national income a precarious two hundred and fifty pounds as an usher in a small school. 
Yet the overwhelming disparity between their income tax returns had never in the slightest degree tarnished their friendship, and Pat had never lent Leonard a penny. All he had done was to persuade him to allow him occasionally to do a little marginal speculation on his behalf, with a rather mythical fifty pounds. These occasional flutters came off in a most magical manner, and every year a most welcome little increment was paid into Leonard's bank. Intellectually, Pat was a child in comparison with Leonard, but in the practical affairs of life he was absolutely his master. Each envied and complimented the other. Pat was of an enterprising and inquiring type of mind, and Leonard stimulated and vitalised strata of his brain which would otherwise have perished of malnutrition. Neither was ever quite happy when separated from the other, though an innate sense of the supreme obscenity of sentimentality would ever have prevented them from acknowledging the fact. Their affection for each other so far surpassed the love of woman that had they been forced to face the conventionally considered ultimate tie of friendship by falling in love with the same one, they would have left her to celibacy or a third person with absolute contentment in the certain knowledge that such a competition would have been essentially discordant and disgusting. Each secretly dreaded the possible marriage of the other, though in the case of poor Leonard, who had to think twice about purchasing packets of cigarettes, and who met about three fresh females per annum, such a contingency was highly improbable. As things turned out, there was no need for either of them to worry. They always spent their holidays together, and on this occasion were passing the Christmas vacation in Tramping the Lake District. The time was almost up, for in three days' time they were due to drive back to London in Pat's impressive car. Perhaps it was this which seemed to cast a shadow over their dinner together that night. Both felt it and confessed to it. Pat applied his usually infallible antidote to irrational gloom by ordering a bottle of Mr. Reddle's champagne and two large glasses of his mediocre port. However, this medicine was not quite as successful as it should have been. Shadow remained. That's a curious yarn about Bruden in the snow, said Welland. In other circumstances it would be easier to explain. This alleged bogey might be, let us say, the personified terror of avalanches. I don't suppose an avalanche has sprayed down Bruden since the end of the Ice Age, and even the traditional memory of the good folk of Borthwaite cannot be as long as that. Still, even on Bruden a blizzard might not be too pleasant. Are you sure you're wise to go alone? Oh, perfectly, replied Seabright. Anyway, I shan't start if the weather breaks. How's the glass, Mr. Reddle? Steady enough, sir. From the looks of the sky, I'd say it will be fine, but dullish tomorrow. They went to bed early, and Welland was asleep at once, but his rest was disturbed by the recurrence of a very idiotic little dream. It seemed to him that it was moonlight, and that he was gazing through the telescope at the cairn, which was throwing a hard shadow onto the snow. And then this shadow began to move, and as it moved, it changed its shape and became more like a crouching beast of some kind than any such shadow had a right to be. And were those flaming points red eyes? And each time, before he could make up his mind on this, for some reason or other, rather urgent question, he awoke. Now I will not dream that again, he said to himself. But a moment later he was once more scrutinising, with a growing anxiety and distaste, this erratic and enigmatic shade. After this had happened five or six times, he sat up in bed. Self-flatterers, he said to himself, would attribute this bother to nerves, honest men to alcohol. What should he do about it? Well, it occurred to him that if he crept very quietly downstairs and swung the telescope onto the cairn, and proved to his full consciousness that nothing of the sort was abroad, then his subconscious, or whatever it was, would be convinced that no such wearisome phenomenon, such change of shape, was occurring at the crest of Bruden. 
The moon was filtering vague rays through light clouds. So much of his dream was true. Well, here was the telescope, and there was Bruden. He put his eye to the lens and swung the glass to the cairn. And then he put it down and rubbed his eyes. And then he took it up again, stared through it intently for a full twenty seconds, and put it down again. And then he returned, rather slowly and thoughtfully, to bed. Of course I must be slightly tight, he said to himself. That's why I can't sleep. That's why I see things through telescopes. No more double ports for me. All the same. And for a moment he felt a powerful inclination to go down again and take up the telescope and make quite sure that. He looked at his watch. Five o'clock. And he did not feel sleepy. He decided to read till it was time to get up. Something which would mobilize his powers of concentration. Essays on truth and reality, for example. Once he found himself dozing off, and there was just the vague, spectral outline of a cairn and a shadow, beginning most exasperatingly to reappear. He pulled himself back to consciousness, and taking each sentence, slowly etched it on his brain. As Mr. Reddle had prophesied, the morning was fine but overcast, and the glass remaining high, Seabright announced his intention of starting at 12.30. He would reach the wood about 2 o'clock, and the summit about 3.30, just as dusk was beginning to fall. There would be enough light to see him down to the wood, and he would be back at the inn before 5 o'clock. And you can follow my progress, Leonard, through the telescope, he said, and mutter prayers for my safety. Now, Mr. Reddle, are you sure you won't come with me? No, thank you, sir. And if you'd take my advice, you'd change your mind. Why not have a try for some of them ducks on the marsh? I'm going to climb the haunted hill, said Seabright, with the utmost emphasis. I'm determined to convince the superstitious natives of these parts that climbing this measly hill, with two inches of snow on it, is not precisely the perilous ordeal they profess to consider it. I shall, if he appears, tweak the nose of the local bogey. And I'm off to do this now. Very well, sir, replied the landlord. And uh, I wish you luck. Seabright set forth punctually at 12.30, and Welland watched his strong, stocky figure striding away down the village street. As he reached the third turning on the right, he turned back and waved. Welland lunched at one o'clock and afterward sat down by the telescope and attempted once again to concentrate upon the profound yet racy speculations of Dr. Bradley, but again without much success. His body seemed to protest against its immobility. It joined in a conspiracy with his nervous system to compel fidgets and fussiness and a sort of tingling unease, so that he repeatedly pulled out his watch and yawned and lit cigarettes and shifted his position, and these tendencies developed and became more insistent. They almost took charge of him, and the effort to resist them was exhausting in a small way. Presently he gave up the attempt to read, and took up the telescope. He searched very carefully the slopes between the wood and the cairn. If those weren't footmarks in the snow, what were they? Very possibly the locals were in the habit of pulling Mr. Reddle's, the foreigner's, leg. Certainly someone had travelled those slopes. Those marks were extraordinarily distinct. Would that be due to their size? He looked at his watch again. Five minutes to two. Pat should be appearing at any moment now. Looking through a small telescope like this was a damn tiring business. Ah! There he was. As he came out from the wood, Welland saw him pause. He is looking at those footprints, or whatever they are, he thought. Seabright remained peering down for half a minute or so, and then began climbing steadily again. Welland found he could just follow him with the naked eye, so he put down the telescope. Mr. Reddle came in just then, 
How's he getting on? he asked. He should be at the top in twenty minutes or so. The landlord seemed not quite at his ease. Getting a bit misty near the cairn, isn't it, sir? Yes, replied Welland. The clouds are coming down. Looks like a change in the weather, I fancy. Well, sir, I shall be in the kitchen for a bit yet. Would you mind letting me know when Mr. Seabright gets back to the wood again? All right, replied Welland, looking at him a shade sharply. It's just a fancy of mine, sir, said Mr. Reddle, if it's no bother. And he went out again. Welland watched the little dark speck climbing steadily towards the cairn till it was but a hundred yards or so from it, and then once again put the telescope to his eye. A few minutes later he saw Seabright reach the cairn, slap it with his hand, and then turn and face towards the inn, and wave his right arm above his head. And then he began rapidly to descend. Welland had started instinctively to wave back, and then had smiled at his stupidity. He was just about to put the glass down again, when he suddenly became tense and intent. He put the telescope down sharply, and rubbed both lenses with his handkerchief, and then he put it to his eye again. For a moment he remained taut and rigid, and then he began to tremble, and then he dropped the telescope to the floor, and then he rushed from the room, out through the front door, and down the village street. As it happened, there was only one person who saw him pass, old Mrs. Elm, who was beating a rug outside her cottage door, when she saw a hatless figure dash hobbling past, and that queer look on his face too. Her mouth fell open, and the rug dropped from her hands. A moment later, she saw this figure turn up the lane and disappear, and then, for several minutes, she remained staring, open-mouthed. Now, Mrs. Elm's brain never exceeded Largo in its temper, and seldom reached it. At the same time, she had a sense for the unusual. She went back to her kitchen and wrestled with the problem of what to do. So presently she put her shawl around her head and trotted up to the hair and form, where she found Mr. Reddle squeezing the digestive apparatus from a chicken. Mr. Reddle, she began, and fiddled with her shawl. Yes, what is it? asked the landlord, pausing in the midst of his culinary business. Well, said Mrs. Elm, I sees one of those young chaps who's putting up here, and I sees him running by in his slippers and without his hat, and he turned up Dim Lane. I thought I ought to tell you. Mr. Reddle stared at her for a moment. Then he rushed past Mrs. Elm and into the guest parlour, stood stock still for a moment, gazing round the room, then noticed the end of the telescope sticking out from beneath the table. He picked it up, stared for a moment through it at the dusk-rimmed crest of Bruton, and then rushed through the front door and down the village street. By a lucky chance, he met the local representative of law and order, Constable Lamb. Mr. Reddle clutched his arm. I think there's maybe something wrong on Bruton, he said. Maybe something's happened to those young chaps staying with me. Mr. Lamb stared at him sharply. It's something in Mr. Reddle's face, and a rather disturbing memory, which had often recurred to lubricate the somewhat sluggish machinery of his imagination, prevented him from asking some rather natural questions. All he said was, We'd better see if the doctor's in. They ran together down the street to where a brass plate announced that R. Ford, M.D., physician and surgeon, had there his habitat. He was in, and he did ask a few questions, but his natural scepticism was also diluted with a certain memory, and presently he picked up his bag, his hat and coat, and an electric torch, and started off with the other two. Soon they were climbing in panting silence through the dusk, the doctor's torch faintly revealing the way. They had just reached the last turn on the path through dim wood, when the doctor stumbled over something. Just describe to us, Constable, exactly how you found the deceased, said the coroner. Well, said Mr. Lamb, Mr. Seabright was lying on his back, his arms thrown out like, and Mr. Wellen was about six yards away. 
he was lying on his face, <laughs> more crouching than lying, but his face was in the snow. They'd both fallen hard. Did you examine the snow for tracks of a third person? Yes, sir. Did you find anything? No, sir. You saw tracks of Mr. Seabright going up and coming down to the wood. But nothing else? Nothing else, sir. Dr. Ford was the next witness. Dr. Ford, said the coroner, I take it you have performed an autopsy on the deceased? I have. Would you tell the court what you learned from so doing? Both were strong, healthy young men, organically flawless. They had sustained extensive superficial injuries, bruises and so forth, and Mr. Welland had a broken arm. Well, these injuries were consistent with the fact that they had been thrown down with great violence. Were these injuries sufficient to cause death? No, emphatically not. Then can you suggest why these two young men died? Frankly, I cannot. It is conceivable that some very violent shock, sudden terror, for example, may have resulted in heart failure in each case. When I say conceivable, I mean just possible. But I am at a loss for a convincing explanation of their deaths. I have known no parallel case. Is Mr. Reddle still here? asked the coroner. Mr. Reddle was, and returned to the box. Mr. Reddle, as I understand it, Mr. Welland had decided not to accompany Mr. Seabright on this climb. Yes, sir. He dirt is ill. Then the fact that he suddenly made up his mind to go to meet his friend was a complete surprise to you. Uh, yes, twas, sir. Can you account for it? No, but I think he'd been watching Mr. Seabright through the telescope. Well, what's that got to do with it? Mr. Reddle was silent for a moment, searching for words. I, I should say nothing, sir, like as not. I only mentioned it, sir. The coroner drummed on the table, but there was otherwise no sound. From outside there came the light crack of a whip and the slow rumble of wheels. Well, said the coroner at length, this seems to me an extremely unsatisfactory affair. All I can do is to express my profound sympathy with the parents of these poor young men. And here he bowed to four persons in deep mourning. And to express my hope that further light will be eventually shed on this highly mysterious and tragic affair. But I see no object in adjourning the inquest. The verdict was open. Mr. Reddle followed P.C. Lamb out of the court and suggested to him that he should come up to the hare and form and have some refreshment. The constable had no objection whatsoever. When they were seated in the parlour and furnished with some glossy old pewter, Mr. Reddle said, You didn't tell the old truth and nothing but it at the inquest, did you, Mr. Lamb? The constable put down his mug and looked suspiciously at the landlord. Yeah, how's that? he said. What makes you for to say that? Because I was watching you through the glass when you climbed Bruton the morning after we found those poor young chaps. The constable shifted uneasily in his chair. If I tell you what I seed, will it go no further? Will you keep your tongue quiet about it? He said at length. I'll do that, replied Mr. Reddle. Well, said Mr. Lamb, a year or two before you came, there was a London chap found dead in the wood. And that time... I did tell all I'd seed, and the chief constable sent for me to Rendell and asked me a lot of questions, and at the end of it he said, huh, they brew strong ale in both ways, don't they? <laughs> and what did you say to make him laugh? I said I'd seen marks in the snow coming along behind the marks made by the London chap. What sort of marks? I don't believe I'll be after saying what those marks was like. I don't somehow feel like doing it. Not out loud, that is. But I'll say this. It seemed to me 
that whatever made those marks, some of the time made four, and not two of them. Sort of crouched down like a time or two. Maybe that, replied the constable. About those tracks, said the landlord, you could make out the ones Mr. Seabright made up and down. Yes, I could. Would you say he noticed anything? I mean, anything that might have to do with them other marks? Well, said Mr. Lamb, he went up steadily enough. But after he'd come down a couple hundred yards, I judge he'd stopped and looked round. Well, he could tell that plain enough. And then he'd started to run. Started to run, did he? exclaimed Mr. Reddle. Well, that was easy to read, too. His stride got longer and he came down harder, and he kept up the running till he got to the top edge of the wood, where we found him. And just as he got there, I take it this Mr. Welland met him, and Mr. Seabright stopped, and the two of them faced up to... whatever, well, to whatever there was to face up to. That's what they would have done, said Mr. Reddle emphatically. I guess that's the rights of it. They'd face up to it together. And then there was a long silence in the hair and form. Snow's off brooding now, I take it, asked the constable at length. Yes, said Mr. Rattle. I looked through glass at it round about dinner time, and even that last big patch round Cairn is melted. Today's story was The Cairn by H. R. Wakefield. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.